El Tráfico went down this weekend. It did go in favor of the Galaxy, but we've got the Spanish voice of LAFC, Francisco X Rivera, on the podcast. Going to help us re recap it all. Find out in the next edition of Sideline Sports Podcast. <laughs> Welcome to Sideline Sports Podcast. If you're not on the sideline, it's not Sideline Sports Podcast. What an action-packed weekend it was. Whether you're a soccer fan, baseball fan, boxing fan, you guys name it. There's, there's just a lot going on this weekend. But I'm Alex Naveka from Sideline Sports Podcast. Or if you're not on the sideline, it's not Sideline Sports Podcast. The source of your SoCal sports news. And on my left side, he is making his Sideline Sports Podcast debut. He is going to be doing all of the soccer inside work, covering all of your LAFC and Galaxy and some more bonus soccer stuff. He goes by the name of Jose Duran. Jose, how are you doing today and how does it feel to make your debut tonight? It's great, Alex. It's a pleasure to be here with you and Francisco as well. Uh, excited to go ahead and get this going with Sideline Sports. Uh, you know, when you, had, you want to go ahead and brought this topic for me, I knew it was something that I wanted to get myself into, working with great people like yourself and Mark. So excited to get these going. And what better way than to go ahead and start getting all the madness that went down this weekend. Like you mentioned, not only just soccer, but it's boxing, everything else. But what we're here to discuss today is LAFC and LA Galaxy. And Francisco, so glad you could be here with us today. Thank you, Jose, Alex. And Alex, we met at uh, Long Beach State during the visit. Uh, the speech I, I gave to, to your class and, you know, so glad to collaborate with a fellow 49er. All the best to you guys and glad to be here. Always a pleasure to work with a former 49er, dirtbag, however you guys want to call it <laughs> nowadays. But you know what, before we even talk about the business today, this episode of Sideline Sports Podcast was brought to you by Manscaped. If you guys need any grooming needs, make sure to go on manscaped.com. Use our promo code SIDELINE20 to save yourself 20% off plus free shipping. We'll go ahead and take care of that for you. We've got the great Weed Whacker right here. It's got great presentation. The work is just great quality. I'm holding it right now, and it feels like legit stuff. This isn't anything that just is cheaply made. I've used it before. Very precise, very accurate cuts, and it feels nice. And remember, first impressions matter the most. So let's go straight into the business, guys. First of all, Francisco, did you get a chance to see that Canelo fight over the weekend? I did. I did, yeah. I, uh, I watched it. You know, it was what I expected and what a lot of people, I think, expected. There is no one really in the same class as Canelo right now, the best pound, pound for pound in the world. And, you know, he gets very criticized because he hasn't gotten into wars or because he doesn't show that Fajador Mexicano style, a, a brawler per se. But you know what? He, he does what he has to do. And I, I heard a point from a colleague at work that was very interesting to me because a lot of people make reference to the Julio Cesar Chavez, Ricardo Finito Lopez, the Juan Manuel Marquez guys of the world. And, you know, they talk about them getting into wars and them winning with that Fajador Mexicano style, with that brawler style. But, you know, Canelo is a bigger guy than, than all of them. He has power. He just has a different style, and he shows it a different way. So, and then again, he keeps on winning. He keeps on breaking attendance record. He keeps on getting richer. He's a very smart guy, and I think he has been advised by a, a lot of smart people as well. So, props to him because I think he's he's an example not only to the boxing community but in general to to that Mexican businessman or businesswoman that that wants to make a buck. I, I think he's done an amazing job. Yeah, absolutely. This guy just continues to dominate in the ring, even though a lot of people are always judging, hey, you're not you're not fighting big name guys. At the end of the day, you, you got to be good. You got to be consistently good. You got to rack up the rankings. You got to rack up those numbers and such until when a big name guy tries to come and challenge you, he's going to be ready. He's not going to be one of those. Hey, I've faced off all of these other guys that are still in the developments trying to get create a name for themselves. But he was still in there. He's still getting hits. He's still looking really good. He's He's that's Canelo for you. He he's not afraid to take a challenge from anybody. But 
talking about a challenge, what about this weekend's game? This match on Saturday, Galaxy and LAFC. El Trafico being back, baby. What a match it was. I'll go ahead and give you the mic right there, Francisco. What, what were your thoughts throughout this whole entire 90 minutes? It is a, it's a very different uh, derby than it used to be. Uh, my first one was the one at Dignity Hill Sports Park when it had a different name, when Zlatan Ibrahimovic comes in uh, in the last 30 minutes of the game and he completely transforms the game. You know, LAFC was blowing uh, Galaxy out of the water and all of a sudden he comes in and he turns the game around, he turns the table around. Uh, when I was calling LAFC games during that Zlatan era, I was always very, very fearful of whatever could happen with Zlatan up front and Pavon, who was, you know, an amazing addition to the Galaxy then. Um, I thought they could, tra they could transform the game anytime. And obviously that rivalry against Carlos Vela was very, very special. Um, this was a very different addition just because Vela wasn't there. And I don't see, you know, the Galaxy being that, even though in, in the stands and the fans might feel like it, to me, you know, without Zlatan, the, cla the classic or the traffic or the Derby Angelino, whatever you want to name it, it's lacking something, right? At least for me on the field. Uh, but then all of a sudden, you know, seeing Chicharito on the field, you know, he, his positioning is incredible. He's smart. You know, he's, he's such a, a great addition to the Galaxy. And he showed it. You know, he, he was always in the right moment, right place, right time. And he, he changed the game. So for me, it was not only about the Galaxy going forward and trying to do something, but it is just about when they get a chance how is Chicharito going to react? Is he going to get the ball? Where is he going to get the ball? So um, I, I thought it was, uh, it, it's a very different feel, at least in my opinion. But at the same time, it, it, it's, it, it can't stop being a very, very uh, huge event for, for the community in Los Angeles and obviously for the soccer fans here in LA. Yeah, for sure. I completely agree with you, Francisco, in terms of uh, what you said. I think it's obviously without Vela, it's already missing something. Without Slapan, it was already missing something. And even throughout the game, you felt like when the Galaxy scored their first goal after that, there was nothing else going on throughout the game. It was very plain. There wasn't that much, even players getting each other's faces. But aside from, from all that and, and soccer-wise talking, I think the, there's obviously two different teams in terms of the LAFC, right? There's a team with Vela and there's a team without Carlos Vela. And unfortunately, this team without Carlos Vela, uh, we don't know how long how longer he's going to be out for, for LAFC. And it's very beginning of the season, as, as, as you know, too. But uh, it's going to be something to, to definitely keep an eye out. And then inside of the Galaxy, you know, even though they did win the game and they are in, in the better positioning in the, in the MLS tables right now, you know, they did lose 3-0 against Seattle and they did not look good in that game. This game, they almost tied it. If it wasn't for a, a Mark Anthony K error in the back that lost the ball that led to the goal for, for the Galaxy and they, they scored, obviously, the 2-1. But outside of that, both teams... At least for, for, for the LAFC side, expectation-wise, they're not there, but it's still the beginning of the season. Well, I agree with you, Jose, but um, I was uh, listening to Bob Bradley's press conference after the game, and he said, we've been coping well with the absence of Cardos. I mean, he only played eight games last year because he didn't go to the tournament. His wife was expecting, and then he comes back, gets injured in, on a game against the Galaxy, by the way. Uh, so, you know, the team has been able to cope without him. It's a reality, and obviously – you know, you, you can't have a guy like Carlos on the get bench on the sideline and expect to be as successful as you could be with him on the field. But at the same time, you have to adapt and you have to cope. And, and then again, he's only played one game this year or a fraction of a game. Yeah. He only played eight games last year. It was a shortened season, but still eight out of like 26 games. That means a lot. So he's only been part of 33% of LAFC's game so far. And you know what? The other games, the other guys have to, have to step up. I was really happy to see Diego Rossi stepping up last year, not only as a leader on the field, but uh, also as a striker, as a great presence on the pitch. I am very glad to see what Cordy Baird can mean to this team, a guy that can get inside the area in, in angles, that can get behind the defender, that touches the ball quickly and gets into quick uh, give-and-go passes. And one of them actually resulted in Rossi's goal. Guys in midfield like Mark Anthony Kay, like Eduardo Tuesta, stepping up, being the leaders. A lot of people forget that you put Bella aside, and most of these guys are 25 and under. So these are young leader, leaders that have learned to play in the league, coming in as future prospects, but are already reality. So then again, the Bella thing I understand is terrible not having Carlos on the field, but at the same time, you got to deal with what you have. It, it's unfortunate, but it is what it is. 
Yeah, mentioning that, you know, they with that being said, they were still undefeated heading into this game, speaking with that, with two ties and a victory. So I understand that uh, completely from, from what's coming from your end. But the reality is that, you know, he he's not playing there. And then the team without him is not performing at the level, at least the expectation that we should have for, for Bob Bradley's side. You know, that thing that happens when you're such a great team throughout the Major League Soccer season and, and, and you get yourself in the MLS playoffs, since the beginning of your existence is that expectations come with that. And unfortunately with LAFC, it's, it's, it's not looking so good, but beginning of the season as well. Yeah. Well, performance wise, they did everything they had to do to win. I mean, they had plenty of chances, you know, they played their game and, you know, usually for you, those of you guys that haven't seen LAFC since the beginning, this is a team that plays with three midfielders, three forwards, and is always used to going forward. It doesn't matter what the scenario of the sport is. They're always used to, you know, just unleashing and going forward. Now, when you have a team like Galaxy who plays with uh, two lines of four, try to impede you from getting inside the box, it gets tough. And especially yeah. with LAFC style, they try a lot of different things. The tiki-taka style, like they say with Barcelona, tic-tac-toe, quick passes around the box, shots from long range, set pieces. They did try it. I mean, unfortunately, there's times that the ball just doesn't go in. But you think about several of those chances that could have gone in and didn't, and those would have changed the game. And that's what's circumstantial about this game and that's why going on to the other end what makes Chicharito so good yeah. the fact is that he he can miss a hundred chances throughout the game but then is if he's got one you know he's gonna be, make sure he's gonna try to convert and he did twice he's got to he got to go and assist both chances because he was a smart guy and he was positioned well but then again you need that fortune I, I, I'm not gonna say luck because I, I don't believe in luck but you know call it fortune if you will call it destiny but you need that. A striker needs that. And in Spanish also, we have a say about uh, porteros, about goalkeepers that say portero sin suerte no es portero. An unlucky goalie is not a goalie, right? You need that, that touch of fortune. And just this time around, it was all in favor of the Galaxy. I, I think LAFC did enough to win the game. There's just times when it can't happen. It, it is what it is. Yeah, and funny that you mentioned the circumstantial one. I think going back into, in terms of not quitting in the back of net, a huge play that happened was when Rossi missed it in the first 13 minutes of the game. A uh, 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 cross that came up to him, he missed it with his right. The goalie, the Galaxy came and kind of disrupted him as he was doing. But I saw, man, if he gets behind that one, it's a different game. It goes LAFC's way. They're leading the way. But in terms of, you know, like you said, it does take us a little luck on your side to go ahead and win it. But these classicals, you know, there's also a saying that it goes, you know, it doesn't matter how pretty you play the game. It's, it's just as long as you win it. You know, the game and the Galaxy's way this time. Yeah, indeed. And as you said, it, it's a lot of circumstance. I mean, you look at the first goal that Chicharito scored. It was a, it was a bad luck uh, touch of the ball from the LAFC defender. And then that sliding tackle from the Galaxy. A lot of people would say, oh, it landed right where Chicharito was. Yeah, but he had to be there. And the guy from the Galaxy had to come up with a sliding tackle and recover the ball. And, you know, so those are things that then again don't, just don't happen because of, of luck. It has to be circumstance. And then again, he went – uh, Galaxy's way, it doesn't mean that Galaxy is a better team than LAFC. I'm not going to say otherwise. It's too early to tell, to be honest with you. I mean, you talk about four, you know, four games, five points so far. Yeah, LAFC hasn't won since their opening matchup against Austin FC, but it's way early to tell, especially when you have seven teams making it to the playoffs. And once you make it there, it really doesn't matter how, how good you were during the regular season. I mean, you go back two seasons ago with LAFC broke all kinds of records, goal scores. Uh, points occurred during the season, best goal differential. Did it matter? No. They, yeah. they exited in the semifinals against Seattle. So then again, uh, you have to, I mean, for me, and you guys talk about this great weekend in Southern California, it, it has to do a lot with the Dodgers too. Um, it doesn't matter how good you are during the regular season. You also have to prove it. You have long seasons. For me, it is about not saying, you know, disrespectfully, but it's warming up. It's getting loose is getting ready for the playoffs. And for me, that's, that's what it is in a format like this. If we're in England, yeah, it'll be a different story. You have to push from game one because you have 38 games to play. And there's only one team that lives a trophy. Obviously, there's other considerations like uh, going to Champions League or Europa League or avoiding relegation. But if you want to be the top team, you have to get the most points. There's no playoffs, right? So here in the U.S. or in Mexico with the Guilla, you know, as long as you're, you're loose, as long as you're relaxed, as long as you close the season in good momentum, I think you're going to be fine for the playoffs. So right now, I wouldn't be concerned about it. Um, I think it's a, it's a long season. We still have 30 games to go. So plenty of soccer to be played.
I know a previous guest of mine, his name is Simon Allen, big time soccer fan. He was talking about how, hey, you can't really determine how good a soccer team is until they play their first seven games. Can you, do you, do you think that's true too? The first seven games will tell you what kind of season they're going to have? It's interesting because I go back to um, LAFC's first season when they're able to get a win in Seattle, a win that no one expected, not even myself. Then they blow out um, Real Salt Lake uh, in Utah. And then they get to go on the road again. They lose to Atlanta. And then they're, they're supposed to be uh, beating Galaxy. The game was 3 nothing, And all of a sudden, this Latin thing comes, you know, he changes the game. So, yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, seven is an interesting number. It's uh, one-fifth of the season, if you will, seven out of 34 games. So, yeah, you might be able to get uh, a good diagnosis of it. There, there's a lot. With MLS, though, let's not forget, there's a lot of different circumstances that happen. First of all, the schedule, right? You're going to have a lot of tournaments played during the summer. Now you have a tournament Superliga where um, some teams from oh, the Campeones Cup, actually, where uh, teams from Liga MX play teams from MLS. And then there's Gold Cup. There's going to be a lot of call-ups and a lot of people that are going to be missing games. And that happened to LAFC last year uh, during, the, during the playoffs. So you guys remember against Seattle, they didn't have all the South American call-ups. They have Palacios y Fuentes, Brian Rodriguez, Diego Rossi. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, all of them contracted COVID. Uh, when they went over there, plus quarantine was not going to allow them to play. So MLS has this factor, this ingredient in which you got to deal with a lot of different obstacles. Uh, so even though I would say, yeah, seven games, but now we're going to head into a break. LAFC is not going to play for three weeks from the end of May to the end of June. So, you know, you, you lose your rhythm. If you have one, you lose your momentum or you can get rid of that bad momentum, if you will. So I, in this case specifically, uh, I don't think the seven games apply because you might be getting, after the first seven games, you might be getting into that second stretch of the season, which might mean we have a whole new season to play. So, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of different things that happen with this roller coaster on my schedule, but it is what it is. It is the way it's played. And I would rather play Minnesota during the summer than be there during the winter, to be honest. So, <laughs> you know, it is what it is, the country that we live in. It's a little harder to play in snow than it is in here in sunny Southern California or anything like that. So definitely what I wanted to ask you about, what did you think about that brilliant goalkeeping by Jonathan Bond? I mean, it looked like LAFC, despite them missing that beat, that's Carlos Vela and missing that offensive piece for them. Diego Rossi and company, it still seemed like they were just slamming and knocking on the door uh, for the Galaxy. And it just looked like LAFC has so many opportunities. But there was a play where Bond was able to save two shots. He, he blocked one. And then he gets right back up and blocks another one. That was outstanding goalkeeping by Bond. I think it's, it's like boxing when you guys opened up with a Canelo comment. Uh, imagine trying to give your opponent everything you have and you can knock him down. Or you knock him down and he comes back up. I think it's, it's the same frustrating way it has to be for, for forwards or strikers. I mean, you're doing everything you can to get past this man, and you can't. I mean, it has to give you momentum. It has to give the goalkeeper his own superpower, like his own aura of invincibility. And at the same time, it has to be really frustrating for strikers not being able to, you know, after doing everything they can do and they still can't get past him. And it's obviously a combination of misses. You know, Jose um, mentioned one by Diego Rossi early in the game. Uh, and it's a combination of good goalkeeping. And then Bond, once again, he's not one of Galaxy's greatest figures. He wasn't even expected to be one of Galaxy's greatest figures. And you've had great Galaxy goalkeepers along the years. Obviously, my good friend, um, Jorge Campos. There's been, you know, Dan Kennedy and so many that have worn that Galaxy jersey. Bond is not supposed necessarily to be that guy. or He wasn't supposed to be the man in the, in the Derby Angelino, but he was. So, you know, props to him. And then again, I think that could be a huge uh, we could call for the Galaxy being like, hey, we have a guy here behind three posts or, or below the three posts that can also give us a, a great way to win. And I think compared for the goalie they had last year, which is David Bingham, it's a great addition to have a bond on, on the fields now. And going back to, you know, the, the miss that Carlos Rossi, I think that kind of just pumps you up in terms of, hey, you know what, it's early in the game. Usually LAFC gets on top of us early on the game, but this time it didn't happen. It's going to be a different game. You got shot up left and right, but it also goes into saying 
that the Galaxy defense isn't as great as everyone kind of paints him out to be, right? They've always really struggled last year with their defense. Now they're, he's the leading MLS, uh, uh, save, uh, save leader of the MLS is uh, Bond. So it's kind of a thing where it's just like a double sword, right? It's a good thing that he's the leading uh, MLS saver. Was that a bad thing talking for the LA Galaxy defense as well? So it's a, it's a thing that definitely it's up in the air. Yeah, definitely. And he does obviously have experience in England playing at lower levels. Yeah. But, you know, once, once you get to, to the United States, it's always, it's always a toss-up. You know, we, we really know what to expect. But he, he can be that guy, one again, that, that you know, gets, gets the starting knot from here on and, and gives the Galaxy a, a chance to win. And obviously, has, that has to be very motivating for defenders. I mean, I have a, a lot of friends that play professionally, goalkeepers and defenders, and they could tell you how motivating for a defender it is to know that you're going to be backed up, that you've, if you mess up, you have a guy to, to get your back behind you and vice versa. So I think, yeah, I mean, he, he, he's going to be a, another big tool for the Galaxy to win. Uh, I think this team has been criticized for building its roster from midfield and, and up yeah. and not really paying attention to that defense, even though they brought guys like Ashley Cole, who was also in, the, in, you know, in, the, um, in decline already. He was uh, 35 years old, I think. He, they brought a couple of pieces here and there. But they're mostly focused on bringing forwards like Pavon, like Zlatan, like Chicharito. And, you know, with the salary cap and this crazy salary rules that you have in MLS, it is tough to build from the back. But, you know, if Bond is able to work, who is, you know, he was a low-impact, um, low-risk uh, hire for the Galaxy, I think, you know, he can be a, a guy to look forward to uh, during the season. Yeah, I think they're going to go as well as their defense goes too. I mean, aside from how Chicharito does good on top and we all know what he does, um, how good is, you know, Araujo and Villafaña going to do in those uh, left back and right back positions throughout the season, you know, and obviously Araujo is a U.S. national team, but there's also sometimes that you kind of see like la last game as well. Uh, there was a long ball that it came, he was the last man and he couldn't control it or bring it down. Those, those little things that obviously it's, it's, it's annoying, it's picky, but the guys are going to go as good as well as his defense goes. And if this defense is not sharp and it hasn't been in the past and it hasn't been so far in the season, even though the Galaxy are uh, on top of the standings, uh, they're going to be a, a lot depending on the defense and see how, how well their season is going to go to, to them. And once again, if you win big games, what does it matter, right? I mean, then again, you know, they were able to hold LAFC, you know, the team that I think was the, the, the biggest firepower or the biggest threat when you talk about offenses in MLS to just one goal, right? And you, talk, you can talk about LAFC or Seattle or Columbus in this league being the top threats up front, you know, it doesn't matter. They were able to win. And, and I think, then again, that has to be a boost of confidence to them to be able to, to move forward and to think, okay, you know, we have a capable team. We have a capable black unit. You know, we can, we can you know, I, I don't know if I have the team, the roster necessarily, or their roster is as balanced as, as I think it would, they would need to be able to beat teams like uh, Seattle, like Portland. They've had a lot, Portland has had a low start, a slow start, but they also play CONCACAF Champions League. So I had to focus their eyes on that too. So uh, I don't think the roster is deep enough, but at the same time, I think, you know, there's always a, a, good, a good point to start. So I want to ask you, what do you think are going to be the next moves move coming up for LAFC? I mean, when are we going to see Carlos Vela back as well? That's a huge piece for them. And I think maybe when he does come back, we can see LAFC back on the road being um, good, just like they were. Well, in terms of Carlos Vela, I mean, the last thing that Bob Bradley said, you know, it's a, it's a minor quad injury, but at the same time, a quad injury can mean a lot. And being a muscle injury compared to bone injury, uh, without being a, a physician myself, and just talking about experience and what I've seen, you know, a game like soccer, when you sprint so much, it's not like basketball where you're back and forward, back and forward, like hockey, right? Uh, and you see that a lot in baseball too, when you hit and then you run to first base, a lot of these minor injuries like... Um, uh, hamstring injuries, you pull something, right? And I think with soccer, it happens too, especially in a high demand position like Carlos Velas. You're going to sprint a lot. You're going to move a lot forward. You're going to need to um, pick your spaces and all of a sudden, you know, go from first to fifth and to, uh, to fifth in, you know, in two or three seconds, right? So I think those can come back. They are annoying from when talking to, to professional athletes, you know, they would tell you they're annoying. Uh, they can come back anytime. And that's an issue, obviously, for a player who's over 30 years old. So, yeah, I mean, you have to think about Carlos Vela coming back. But at the same time, as I said, you have to deal with what you have. And I think Bob Bradley was very smart 
um, just repeating myself about the press conference when he said we're coping with, with Carlos Velez's um, absence well, because I think he has to give confidence to his players. And if Carlos is not able to, if he's able to play great, but if he's not, you know, the other guys have to step up. And it has, it's a double-edged sword. I think it's like he's giving them confidence, but at the same time, it's like, hey, guys, you need to step up. So it's, it's two sides, I think, to that, to that response. So, you know, in, in that sense, I think this, this roster is, is good. I think it's deep. I think you have enough players. Uh, the, the defense was a huge concern last year because you, you brought in a new goalie with uh, Kenneth Vermeer who was not really what they expected, even though he had plenty of experience, even World Cup experience with the Netherlands. Uh, so Pablo Cisniega stepped up. Tyler Miller left for, for Minnesota. Tyler was okay, but he wasn't supposed to even be the starter. They brought a guy, Luis Lopez, from the Honduras national team who got injured and never even saw, I think, but two minutes, two games of action. So um, they brought in Jesus Murillo to play with El Segura. Um, I think defensively, they're okay. I think their midfield set. You might, I mean, if, if you ask me about a move, and then again, I'm not quoting the front office or anything, it's just me, maybe another forward for, for depth, uh, because you have, you're supposed to have Bella, uh, Baird, and, um, and Diego Rossi. Now, if Bella's not playing, who do you put in there? Could be Danny Musovsky. Uh, it could even be Latif Blessing moving forward to his, uh, his original spot. And then from the bench, you have young guys like Christian Torres, like, Poku. But I think last year, a guy that was key was Bradley Wright Phillips, a guy with all the experience in the world, one of the greatest MLS players ever. He left with Columbus. Uh, having a guy like that, I think it could be very interesting, like a veteran striker that you can bring that could be a low risk, low salary um, um, hire could be, could be very interesting. A guy that you can bring on in the last few minutes of the game to try to change the game around. I think if you ask me, that would be a guy that I would set my eyes on. And the next three games for LAVC upcoming at Seattle, obviously a big rivalry up there with them, um, you know, Colorado, New York City FC. What are your expectations for, you know, players like Latif, players like Rossi, and, you know, Atuesta, who just re-signed for them for another year, uh, a, a contract extension. He's a really big emphasis in the midfield with the touches that he has, the plays that he makes. Uh, but moving forward, what are your expectations? You know, we've obviously been discussing how much of a different team this is without Carlos Vela. But like you mentioned, these players have to step up and when their name is called, like those misses like Carlo, uh, like Rossi had the first half that we've been discussing as well, those have to be put in the back of the net sort of wise. Well, what are your thoughts? Well, consistency, I would think, would be what I would be asking for. I mean, Edward has been arguably the, the most consistent guy in that lineup, except for the fact that he's done, you know, been injured. And a guy I've, I've joked with him a few times that, you know, a lot of times I always see him on the grass. He's always on the trenches. He's always fighting for a spot and he's always like kicked on. There was a time against Minnesota when he was kicked in the head and that cost him a couple of games out for a concussion. Um, you know, he's always fighting. He's always in the trenches in that dangerous spot uh, to either, um, you know, I'm not going to say get injured, but get a big knock because of the position that he plays and the intensity that he plays with. So except for those times that he's been out of the lineup, I think he's been the most consistent guy. For Diego Rossi, I think um, not having Carlos Vela made him step up into a different role, as I said, not only as a leader on the pitch, but also off the pitch, being very vocal, being that guy that approaches the referee and argues. And, you know, he's always having the back of, of, of his teammates. And at the same time, you know, he was a leading scorer last year. Um, and you can score them all, being honest with you. But I think you have to score in the biggest moments of the game. I think when that he had a chance in the second half to tie up the game, he did it. Um, it when you're a striker, it's very, it is very unfortunate because we as fans expect them to score every time and that's not possible you have a, a, a professional goalie right in front of you how you have a professional defense right there there's some chances obviously that i would say i'm not going to say they're easy but they're less difficult than others and most likely you have to convert but um yeah i think he if he keeps his average to say a goal every two games i think he'd be doing his job i think 15 to 17 games would be a realistic expectations i think 20 would be great for diego um he's one of the i mean you talk about the biggest goal scorers in MLS in, in the last few years. There's been Joseph Martinez, Carlos Vela, obviously, Zlatan, Jassi Sardes, and right behind him, there's Diego Rossi. And a lot of people forget just because he's been sort of under the shadow of Carlos Vela. And he's been there and only putting a lot of assists, a lot of balls inside the box, but at the same time, he's been scoring. He's been very, very consistent. So um, I think um, guys like, like Latif, uh, guys like Mark Anthony K, you know, not disappearing from games, being consistent, being leaders, 
they're on the pitch. It's like that. Most of these guys started with LAFC when they were under 25 or even under 21 years old. And no, there's no excuse now. Um, these guys are seasoned veterans, and you know they got to be ready to step up, as as we said, even with or without Carlos Vela. Right. Absolutely. I think if you're going to be a good team in the MLS level, you have to continue to play well. You got to continue to play even if your superstars out. Now, I want to finish this episode and I want to give Francisco an opportunity. How about we hear that Spanish broadcasting gold call? Because we've been seeing it all over your Instagram. I know you're dying to be back on the pitch. And I know the viewers, the listeners, they want to hear that goal call that you have. Sure. So, um, as I said, we're finally coming back on Estrella TV May 22nd against Colorado. And I'm going to be optimistic that Carlos is going to be with us. So I'm going to try to recreate as, as best I can. Um, all right. So here we go. Minuto 80 para el equipo de LAFC. Hasta el momento el partido está empatado a cero y necesitamos un gol. Viene la triple S desbordando por el lado de la derecha. Lleva a un, se lleva a un rival, llega hasta la línea final, saca diagonal retrasada, balón rechazado por un defensa del equipo de Colorado. Cuidado porque el balón lo puede encontrar Carlos Vela. Carlos se pega de distancia, el disparo y el gol. ¡Gol! ¡Ha anotado por Carlos Vela! ¡Y qué bonito se siente cantar un gol de mi LAFC! Yeah, there it is. That's it. Hey, speak it into existence, my man. Speak it into existence for all LAFC fans. Thank you, that goes down. Next uh, Saturday against May 22nd, Colorado Rapids uh, against LAFC. It's going to be great to be out there. Once again, I'm pretty sure for you to be back there with the fans. I know as a broadcaster, it's always different when you're just out there in a, in a quiet arena. It's not the same with the fans. So I know it's going to be a different uh, experience for you, Francisco. Yeah, you know what? I, I do have a ritual. Every time I go to Bank of California Stadium, um, I go down there. I go visit the 3252, the North End Stand, where we have our, our, great, our big porra, our, uh, our fan base. And I, I talk to them. Uh, a lot of them know me already, so they say hello. I do an Instagram live usually from there. And I say hello to I point out the fans with the phone, and they, they cheer, and we interact. And I like to soak up that energy from being on the field because once, you know, I'm five minutes before my pregame, which uh, on radio was usually 30 minutes before, um, you know, I can't do anything else. I can't move around. And I'm a social butterfly myself. So I like to go down there, say hi to people, being uh, – LAFC staff, the security guys, executives, even some of the owners out down there early. And I like to say hello, even some players or, or guys that I know from other teams. It, it's happened when uh, Gonzalo Pineda, for example, the former Mexican legend who's now assistant coach with Seattle, you know, I went there and, you know, I know it's hard to talk to them before games, but I go there and he, he you know, comes and gives me a hug, says hello. You know, guys like that you haven't seen in a long time, you, you want, you know, that, that chance to see because once the game starts, There's no, there's no way for me to get out of the booth. And then I have a 30-minute post game. So for me, it's about soaking up that energy, getting pumped up and ready to go. What's going to be special for me is the fact that we called all the Estrella TV games last year from the studio because of limitations and capacity and, and everything. Now this is going to be a, a chance to call the games from our booth, you know, from midfield, Uh, the, from the 50-yard line, as people would say in football, sure. uh, you know, being there and being alongside, you know, one of the guys that I idolized, that, that I grew up watching on, on TV, Claudio Suarez, El Emperador, the guy with the most national team caps in, in Mexican national team history, and then Alexander Asterios, who's our sideline reporter, is doing an amazing job. So being able to share that moment with them, with our great production team, and just being able to call the gold, not from the studio, from a dark booth, that soundproof, but being there with the fans and soaking up that energy, it's, I, I can't wait, man. I can't wait. It, it is for me, as a baseball fan, I can't I can remember the first game that I ever called at Dodger Stadium, which is, for me, you know, the sports cathedral of, of Los Angeles. The first time I did it when I was working for the Angels on Spanish radio when I was there, I'm like, you know, I was, I was a little kid coming to games when I lived in Mexico City and would come from vacation, stay with my family, and now I get to call a game from this booth It's special. Now, I, I am waiting for that moment to happen at Bank of California Stadium. When I was with, you know, with the radio team, I did color commentary in most games. I got to call a couple as a, as a pinch hitter, per se. But now, you know, this is my booth. This is, this is my microphone on Estrella TV and, you know, can't wait to, um, to do it. So it's, it's, it's something that's going to be, I'm, I'm sure, very emotional. Maybe a couple of tears will run down. But once the ball kicks off and I'm able to say, 
uh, we're, we're ready to go. Uh, Dale Black and Gold, which is usually what I say when our broadcasts start. You know, I, I'm, there, there are probably going to be some tears coming down. Well, there you have it, guys. Francisco X. Rivera, the Spanish voice of LAFC. He's, he's almost back, folks. He's almost back. You guys can hear his voice coming up. You said May 22nd, right? That we can, that's when we'll be able to hear you again? Yeah. May 22nd, 7.30 p.m. on Estrella TV. For those of you in L.A., Channel 62 on, on local TV and most um, satellite. And I think it's 62 on Direct TV, 24 on Spectrum. So, you know, you'll find us. You'll find us. And a lot of people had um, – we've gotten great feedback. A lot of people watching since last year. I know last year was tough because you couldn't have fans in the stands. So now there's obviously a lot of those fans that watched us last year are going to be in the stands. But, hey, for those of you watching, you know, can't wait to have you. There you guys have it. Make sure, mark it on your calendars, May 22nd. Go on the channels. Find Estrella TV so you guys can listen out for Francisco X. Rivera and your local TV station, your radios as well. He's going to be hot, guys. He's finally back, the Spanish voice of LAFC. That's all the time we have here left on Sideline Sports Podcast. We thank you all so much for tuning into this one. If you guys enjoyed this episode, please give it a thumbs up. Also, hit the subscribe button down below. This is how we're able to get guests like Francisco X Rivera, just like we had last week, Jalen Hawkins, the safety for the Atlanta Falcons. We're only growing, folks. We're only going up from here. And once again, I want to say this was the debut of Jose Duran, the insider from Sideline Sports Podcast. And Thank you so much to Francisco X Rivera for being with us this afternoon. It was always a pleasure to have you on. It, it, it was my pleasure, guys. Thank you, Jose. Thank you, Alex. And best to you. Thank you, Francisco. The best to you as well, Francisco. Wish you nothing but the best and what's to come. Of course, Kings didn't exactly have the year that we were hoping for since you also do the King stuff. But uh, LAFC, now the focus now for all uh, soccer fans here in L.A., that's the team that you want to focus on. But this episode was brought to you by Manscaped. Make sure to go on manscaped.com. Get yourself some legit products, such precise and accurate shaving. You get yourself the Lawnmower 3.0 that comes up with that LED there and such great, such accurate grooming. And remember, first impressions matter the most. Use our promo code SIDELINE20 to save yourselves 20% off and free shipping. I'm Alex Naveja from Sideline Sports Podcast, signing off from this. And again, if you're not on the sideline, it's not Sideline Sports Podcast, the source of your SoCal sports news. Take care, everybody. Have a good week.